Um, so I suppose just to get us started, um, Minister, I, I thought I'd just start maybe by uh, setting the scene and giving a bit of context uh, before we get underway. Um, I suppose in the last number of years uh, in the Eurozone, uh, we've had what I would describe as a period of relative stability and relative growth. Um, but nonetheless, we have faced three crises. The first being Brexit. Uh, and although Brexit occurred in 2016, uh, Brexit, of course, only took effect in January 2020. Um, second of those being, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which necessitated an almost complete uh, shutdown of the economies within the Eurozone and the third of those being Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, in response to that, central banks reacted. They raised interest rates in response to inflation. And here we are today now in 2024, where uh, although the Eurozone economy has proved remarkably resilient, I think you might agree that some of the forecasts and some of the predictions are not as one would have hoped uh, for this year. Um, and many expect that Germany, the Eurozone's largest economy, may in fact be in recession. So I suppose the first question to you, Minister, to get us started, is the glass half full or is it half empty? Glass is always half full, always half full. Uh, glass, glass is always half full uh, because we have to be in a position uh, where we can talk about the progress that we have both made and the progress that we can make. Uh, I would make the case uh, that given the circumstances that we have been in, uh, that stability is a remarkable achievement to be in a currency zone where we are sharing a currency across 20 countries and deal with a pandemic, and then to be in a situation where we are uh, the global reserve currency most closely affected by the war and still have economic stability and still have more people at work than ever before and still have economies that are growing. That is a... a, um, a uh, a strong rationale for saying the glass is half full. However, uh, it would be inauthentic and less than honest not to recognise that we do have very significant challenges ahead, but they are challenges that I'm confident uh, we can, with good leadership and common sense, respond back well to. And, and in terms of your uh, priorities for the first half of the year, uh, for the Eurogroup, what are some of the key issues that you're focusing on? Well, I always talk about uh, three C's, the tree of C of coordination, the C of competitiveness, and then the C of the currency itself. Coordination is our efforts within the euro area to coordinate budget policy, to get the balance right between supporting employment and getting inflation down. The C of competitiveness, and in particular, the relationship between competitiveness and capital, ma capital markets and how we need to deepen our capital markets within the euro area, make more progress towards the capital markets union, and then the C of the currency itself, the future of the currency, how we can hopefully set the uh, scene for the early entry of Bulgaria into the euro area, and how we can continue with our work regarding the digital future of the currency. So I pick out those three Cs amidst all of the other things that we're working on has been particularly important. And we, we might address each of those in turn, but um, I suppose just starting with the with the coordination piece, um, what's the general advice that you're giving in terms of fiscal policy for, for member states? Uh, that fiscal policy has to be in a uh, restrictive stance, which is very difficult at the moment, given the many political and social pressures that we are facing. We, however, have to be taking steps now to reduce borrowing. If you have a deficit, to make it smaller. If you have a surplus, to keep it and make it bigger. Uh, we have to be in that position because critically, we are now in, I hope, the final phase of the journey of getting inflation down. And in getting inflation down, uh, this last part of the journey could well be the hardest. And it's really important that budget policy does not add to demand within economies and make it harder to get inflation down. Of course, it's particularly important uh, and demanding that as we are doing that, there's a few areas that we still need to keep on investing in. And that balance between current expenditure and capital expenditure is a fine line to walk at the moment. But the value of the Eurogroup is we have a better chance of making that journey and completing it if most countries are trying to do it together. Mm. And I suppose a lot of people would say, you know, in, in this new era, um, and in particular over the next couple of decades, um, there will be a number of investment needs the member states would have. I mean, one can think of the green transition, 
um, obviously moving to the to the digital transition, as you've mentioned, um, also increased defense spending uh, in response to uh, Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, how do we square the circle uh, in that sense of having a what we need is a restrictive fiscal policy now, but yet at the same time, we need to have this investment in our future that we're going to need over the next couple of decades? Two priorities. We have to make next generation EU work. Uh, we have to be able to prove that the co-funded budget instrument uh, of such scale, hundreds of billions of euro, that is next gen EU, we have to prove to each other that that can work and prove that that is playing a role in increasing the, the medium term growth potential of the euro area. And secondly, it is wider work in relation to capital markets union is so important. Other parts of the world, the Gulf states, China and America, can rely on their private sector to do things with their levels of savings that we're not in a position to be able to do here in Europe. And while this is a journey that will continue to take time to complete, we have to accelerate our progress on it. And that's a project that I'm working on with my fellow finance ministers at the moment. So make next generation EU work, take further steps in relation to capital markets union is our best chance of resolving those two kind of competing imperatives. Mm. And, and just on um, next generation EU, a question I, I thought I'd ask you, um, you've reminded me of, of a presentation that um, Joseph Stieglitz actually gave to the Institute um, a few years ago. And one of the things he suggested um, was that obviously the response of the European Union, as I said, was very, um, very quick, uh, very forthright. Um, in terms of agreeing the next generation EU fund and targeted also, which I'd say would differ with, say, with the United States, um, where it was just, say, checks in the post and things like that. Um, but at the same time, at the beginning, I think there was a lot of political energy expended um, in terms of agreeing the fund uh, at the beginning. Um, so I suppose a question, maybe one thing that I've been thinking about and one thing that Professor Stiglitz suggested, um, would it be an idea to say invest now in negotiating these structures permanently within to the European Union uh, architecture so that if we say a counter cyclical type fund where if you invest the money now, um, and I know we do this with a single resolution fund, for example, in, in the banking sector, but investing the money now so that we build up those reserves and are able to disperse it uh, then in the bad times. Um, and I suppose then you wouldn't have either the situation of common borrowing, which which um, was quite unpalatable to certain member states. So just an idea to, to put out there. So, I mean, these are ideas that are frequently uh, 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 generated, but out there for public debate within the European Union. Of course, we're a collection of democracies. So it's so important that we're willing to evaluate different ideas and discuss them with each other. But I think in terms of practically making something like that happen and looking at how it can be moved ahead, it does go back to why next generation EU is so important. Uh, if there is an appetite to do something further in the future, an appetite to create another budget instrument, one that could be funded in a different way, there's no way around us. We have to make what is in place at the moment work first. We have to show that, for example, uh, Irish money that we are using, we are now a net contributor to the European Union. Net contributors have to be able to see that the money they put into next generation EU, the debt that we are raising together has been put to the use that we want it to be put to. And then those countries that are receiving the money equally, they want to be able to show to their citizens that they're using that money in a way that has genuine value and can help us all grow quicker. So ideas like that will be continue to be generated, continue to be debated and evaluated. But practically speaking, we won't get to the point of anything new happening until we can show that the historic agreement that led to next generation EU was actually being implemented in the way we want. Mm -hmm. And I believe that will happen, by the way. Mm. Uh, in terms of capital markets union, um, it was discussed at the at last meeting of the Eurogroup, as I know, um, you're going to bring a proposal to the Euro Summit. Um, is there any detail you can provide at this stage on that? Well, actually, the document has been well leaked uh, to a number <laughs> of news outlets across Europe. So it's no longer a secret. Uh, you can all easily access it in any, in any digital format that you want. And it is a, a, a whole collection of really important interventions 
that we're using to try to invite the next commission to take further action on in the next mandate. Uh, it covers off an array of different areas. If I was to pick out two that I think are be particularly important is uh, what we can do uh, to further make use of securitization options here within the European Union and in particular uh, uh, financially, what we can do there. And secondly, a really interesting idea that's developing regarding a common European savings product, where we would encourage young people like yourselves to invest into products that would be available all across Europe that would be used in turn to support and invest in particular elements of our common European future. They're just two ideas, uh, but it's a multi-page document available on all good financial and current affairs websites as we spin. And available soon at the Euro Summit. And available officially at the Eurozone <laughs> Summit soon too. Um, ju just in terms of uh, Capital Markets Union and just from some of the conversations we would have in here, um, it would seem a lot of the architecture is already in place um, in terms of the, the, the action plan that was proposed by the Commission, a lot of legislation agreed. Um, but so much of this, I think, is cultural as well, um, in the sense that obviously in Ireland, perhaps we have the tendency to in, you know, put our savings in banks. We don't have the same tendency, perhaps in the European Union or in the Euro area, to uh, invest, as they say would in the United States, uh, as a sort of general uh, practice. Um, how do you think we can we can bridge some of those cultural barriers that would mean you know citizens and businesses would be more likely to invest in different types of assets, which ultimately is a good investment. I, I think that is a great question, and ultimately that will be a question of how we change cultural preferences through education as well. Um, I mean, it is something that will take um, so much time to make a difference to. One of the reasons, for example, there's such a a different attitude towards equity markets in the United States is they have a very different attitude to risk and they have very different expectations of what the state will do for them. Here in Europe, here in Ireland, we have a different tolerance for risk and we have different expectations regarding what the state will make available to you later in life. For all of those reasons, it means we have a very different attitude towards our private capital and to the use of that capital within an economy. So that, Dara, is one that it will be, uh, it's going to take a lot of time to do. But if I was to pick out one area, which I think is capable of making a difference in Ireland and in other countries, it's the plan in relation to auto enrollment that Heather Humphreys is working on at the moment, my, my colleague, the Minister for Social Protection. Because while that might deepen your uh, tolerance for risk, it will create deeper pockets of capital within a country and how that capital might be invested and how that could affect the supply of capital within national economies, I think is something that is really interesting and could have a very big impact then on capital markets within the European Union. Mm. And just getting back to the to the overall point of, of competitiveness, um, I suppose just, just in terms of something that will be common to a lot of Euro area countries, I think is this issue of energy security. Mm -hmm. Um, in response to, to Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, are you satisfied with the steps that are being taken across the, the Eurozone in that space at the moment, or do you think there's more we can, we can do? There? Well, I think we should take great confidence from our efforts with regard to energy security. But energy security and energy competitiveness are related, but they are different concepts. So we have performed within the European Union, our energy ministers, our regulators, our energy suppliers performed a miracle at the end of 2020 and in 20, at the end, excuse me, of 2022 and in 2023, a miracle. The transition that happened across so many economies to move away from imported Russian gas and source energy in other ways was an extraordinary policy achievement. And it's frequently the case, really big changes that lead to the absence of a negative sometimes don't get the recognition and analysis that they merit. But that's energy security. The issue of energy competitiveness, the availability of low cost energy is just a gigantic project that we've an awful lot of work to do on. 
And if there's any group of people that know the origins of the European Union, it's all of you. Uh, you remember that the early phases of the European Union was also about energy, it was about coal and the sharing of coal. And it feels to me that this is something that we have huge work to do on in the time ahead that, of course, is ultimately tied into as well, but not always completely aligned with the need for us to be a move to net zero and how we're going to green our energy supply here in Europe. So it is a project worth devoting a life to, to see how we can make progress on that. We will, but it is perhaps the biggest economic project at the moment that can have an effect on what our medium-term competitiveness will be. And, and then um, on the point of the, um, the common currency, I suppose, firstly, um, how do you think the euro area can grow the euro status as an international reserve currency? So uh, I believe, for example, it's now a matter of when Bulgaria joins, not if. Uh, I believe we're underestimating the growth potential of the euro area in terms of accession. Uh, new options and possibilities, I think, will open up in the time ahead. In terms of, though, the future growth of the euro as a global reserve currency, I think there's two elements of it that would be so important. Number one, uh, what steps we can take to increase the growth potential of the euro area in the medium term. And secondly, it undoubtedly goes back to the question put to me earlier on, Dara, regarding work that we can do in the capital markets of the euro area. And I think they're the two pieces in the jigsaw regarding how we can bolster the attractiveness of the euro on the global stage. And one thing you you also mentioned is the uh, the digital euro, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I actually I gave a presentation to a group of students last week uh, on a paper that I'd done for the institute. Shameless plug uh, of a paper I'd done um, for the institute on the on the digital euro. I was a bit surprised at the the lack of enthusiasm actually from from a lot of the um, a lot of the students in relation to this. But yet at the same time, I think a lot of people had invested money in crypto. Uh, and I always well, they'll know the value of the digital euro and later <laughs> in life. Then. Yeah, well, after well, I always remember um, the quote from Andrew Bailey, the the governor of the Bank of England, uh, who said, "You should only be prepared to invest in crypto if you're prepared to lose all your money," uh, which yeah. is what he said. So, um, but I suppose um, just in terms of the the digital euro, I think from from that presentation and what we've seen in here, I think the biggest challenge is uh, I think developing. A convincing use case for it, um, particularly within the euro area, and I think in the United States as well, where where there's discussions ongoing. How do you think we can convince people of that of that use case? That it is an idea uh, that is about the future, hmm. and the idea, the reason why we have so much of a challenge making the case for it now, is it's getting ready for a world that is yet to arrive. Uh, we have a world that is rapidly approaching, which will be so much more digital than the world of today. We have a world that will be rapidly approaching in which other global reserve currencies will be in a digital format and in which currencies and means of payments will be available that are not backed by states and not backed by projects like the European Union. And in that world, we will need a digital euro because you will need a trusted means of payment and a trusted store of value. And states and the ECB and the euro system will need the euro area because in the absence of our currency being digital, it will weaken uh, the value and need of the euro as a transmission mechanism of economic policy. Now, of course, that argument is not one you can fit into a tweet. It doesn't easily lend itself to a nice Instagram or to a short news bulletin or, or soundbite. But that's not the reason not to get ready for it because there will come a time in which you as citizens of the Euro area and the European Union will realize this is why I need us. And we have to do that work and get ready for that moment now. But still a number of years away. And we've time to make that case during that moment, during that journey. Okay, very good. Um, let's get some questions in, uh, if people have them. So my colleague Keen has the microphone. I think I can see everyone, but if I can't, Keen will point them to me. I see Owen Flaherty first. Um, and if you might just identify your name and your affiliation as well, please. Sure. Uh, Owen Flaherty, Central Statistics Office. Um, you mentioned the expansion of the EU or the euro area, specifically, well, kind of both. 
Um, do you have any thoughts on the architecture of the EU and the EU area? The constant challenge of the EU is speaking with coherence and getting consensus in an efficient way. Um, how can we increase that in the context of a growing EU or Euro area? Yeah, so Owen, uh, thank you very much. And I know this sounds really nerdy, but I'm a great fan of the Central Statistics Office. Uh, I think you do phenomenal work, phenomenal work, uh, helping us uh, really objectively understand our country and the amazing work you then, that you've done in recent years communicating your work is super. Uh, so there we go. That was a really nerdy thing to say, wasn't it, Dara? Good, good. I love to see it so as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so then, um, yes, um, if you look at the last phase of a change in decision making within the European Union, which was in particular the Lisbon Treaty, uh, that the catalyst for that was the growth and the scale of the European Union uh, and the number of new members that came in to join us. So uh, what are my thoughts in relation to the architecture of an expanded uh, Euro area in particular? Firstly, there are some areas in which I don't believe we'll ever move away from the principle of unanimity. Um, and there would be particularly economic areas uh, that are so core to how nations conduct their work with their citizens. I'd be surprised if in the time ahead we moved away from the principle of unanimity. But the good news is, even with that maintenance and focus and consensus, we still find ways to make progress. And even if it takes longer to get to that agreement, that agreement is more durable. Like if you look at the history of the European Union, and if you look at the history of the Euro area, how many times in those areas of policy in which unanimity is needed, have you seen the EU go backwards? Really, really rarely, if never. And even if our pace of decision-making within the Euro area can sometimes be more gradual and slower, because we need unanimity, it's far more resilient and far more durable. And my sense of the world that we're in with the volatility that we are facing is that durability uh, uh, will have, sorry, I, I smile when I say durability because I've been talking lots about durable relationships in another setting, will have even greater value. And then in relation to changes in decision-making as the European Union gets big, bigger, I think it's inevitable there will be a big discussion on that. That discussion will happen. Um, but I perhaps will confine myself to saying, don't underestimate the value of unanimity. Don't underestimate it as a competitive advantage for the euro. Or that the member states have a durable relationship with each other as well. <laughs> well, actually, it's a highly durable relationship. <laughs> and very modern. <laughs> very good. Um, I see, I think it's Neil at the back, is it? Yeah. Hey, Neil. Uh, yes. Um, Neil Stokes, PwC. My question is around the sort of corporation tax landscape and sort of how do you see the next sort of few years panning out in terms of obviously there's objections or in the US with the Republicans that's slowing down with respect to pillar one um, and then respect to pillar two. How do you see that playing out for Ireland? So, um, so firstly, um... Uh, I, I, I believe the only game in town is the OECD process. And we have to find ways of making it work. Uh, because in the absence of the OECD program, process, which I spent five years working on, in the absence of that making process, making progress, the risk for instability and risk uh, in corporate tax policy is significant. I think it could be a real risk. And while that might be good news, frankly, for tax professionals uh, and um, uh, lawyers, 
because of the complexity and the difficulties of coordination and getting consistency in national tax policy. For trade and economic growth, it would be bad news. So I think we have to continue to remain committed to it. Of course, it is something that's becoming more challenging, you know, in the US with the with you know with 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 some of the views that have been raised there. But I think here in Europe, we have to continue to show our commitment to the implementation of the minimum rate. And then in relation to the reallocation of taxing rights, continue to work creatively with global partners on it. Uh, because I think in the absence of that OECD framework, uh, real challenges could emerge in the future of global corporate tax cooperation. So thank you very much for your question. Good. I'm, you see, if I if I have the same approach to PwC as I do to the CSO, I then have to ask, is there anybody here from EY? And I'll have to work <laughs> my way around all the accounting practices in the, in the country. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just get in trouble. It, it's a little too early for me to think about what my legacy is going to be, you know, to be honest with you. <laughs> but the removal of those two words was a really big deal. A very big deal for Ireland. And um, a really critical moment for the process in the OECD moving on. It was a big, it was, uh, it was a, a day I won't forget uh, for a long time. And, and just in terms of the um, the sentiment from uh, some of the big companies here, given that the, the tax rate, I believe it has now moved to, to 15%, yeah. um, no no adverse reaction to that? Really good. Yeah. Uh, companies like PwC, colleagues like Neil here and the work he does is really important in terms of explaining to, to investors what's going on and so on. The big learning I have from all of that work though over a number of years is the value of predictability, the value of clear communication and minimizing surprises. No government can ever rescind the right for unilateral action when it comes to taxation. Uh, and no government, particularly a European government, particularly a government that has such a powerful independent organization like the Revenue Commissioner can ever give indications um, uh, that would be, uh, you know, imperil the budget process. But doing all you can to be predictable, clear and certain regarding how tax policy would evolve. That's the secret of us. That's the real importance. And we have to just relentlessly continue with that approach. And it's something the Department of Finance is really excellent at. And it's something that Minister McGrath really understands the value of and is very very good at doing hmm. very good i saw some uh questions here as well yeah yourself over there thanks tina um thanks pastel for coming along uh, my name is kieran sullivan i work in the central bank um yeah i was hoping <laughs> um my question is on um competitivity and the capital market union and um in respect to Ireland and our kind of domestic financial institution environment, how can we contribute to the development or the potential development of the capital market union? Uh, it's a great question. I would pick out. So I, I actually will go back to something I said earlier on. It's the auto enrollment project. It really is. And it's my biggest learning from the work I've done on capital markets. I always thought about auto enrollment as a project for income adequacy and how we support the income of people like you later in your life. And I never joined the dots between that project and how it deepens so much the availability of capital within an economy over the space of a number of decades. And the most interesting part of what we did in all of this was hearing my colleagues um, in, in Holland and the Nordic economies talk about this. And they drew the link 
which was amazing for me, between their pension systems and their share of patents in life sciences. Because they said we deepened our savings and only by our, uh, by deepened our savings, we increased the availability of capital. And then by our institutions, just making a small share of that capital, normal share of that capital, always available year after year after year, it created a whole new investment stream for companies that are European to, to, to prosper. And I never made that link in my own mind. And that tends to be something that departments of finance don't really have. That tends to be work that is left more and more to departments of social protection and their equivalent departments in other countries. The big thing I've learned is the value that project can have in the medium term. And uh, it's a, something I'm really seized with here in Ireland. So I'd really go back to that doing that really well. How can we get your savings that you set aside for your pensions and for later in life, how can we ensure the return on that savings is helping create the companies of tomorrow here in Ireland and in Europe? And that's, that's the challenge. And I suppose it links into the uh, competitiveness again. I suppose yeah. some people would ask, I mean, why has Europe never had a European champion say, um, now I know we, Spotify, for example, is one very large company in the European Union, but in terms of the United States would have, you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, um, Apple. Um, do you think we should strive to have more of these European champion type companies? I suppose, obviously, that comes with its own challenges in terms of regulation and things like that. But um, Of course, absolutely, we have to. We absolutely have to. And like so much of that is a feature of so many of the questions you've already put to me regarding the availability of capital, <clears throat> attitudes towards risk. And what, you know, I, I have never seen an entrepreneurial uh, uh, potential within the Irish economy and in other European economies like I'm seeing at the moment. I've never seen such talent and such innovation as we have now. So I'm actually certain we have the potential to grow those companies in the time ahead. I'm certain of it. The question is, who's going to own them? That's the question. Who's going to own them and who's going to benefit from them? Is it going to be Europe or will it be other parts of the world? And uh, like, you've, have any of you heard, I hope I get this right now, Granola? Have you seen that? I have got the acronym right, haven't I? It's the list of Europe, European companies that in the last few weeks have been driving the development of European equity markets. And it's a great acronym that I can't remember, but if any of you have a device that has all the knowledge of the world in it, you can type it in now and tell me it's granola right. Coined by, I think it was one of the Goldman or somebody like that, uh, for a whole collection of companies spread all over Europe that are now driving equity market growth in Europe. So we'll, we'll no doubt have a look at that. Yeah. Um, more questions. So I see uh, three hands here. Um, I saw this gentleman's hand here at the back first. Hey, my name is Oshie Maxuini. We actually met a couple of weeks ago in UC. I'm with uh, the Economic Society there. Um, my question pertains to um, the mentioning of energy security and the difficulty in making it cheaper. Um, and of course, alongside uh, capital markets and the deepening of that. Um, what's the sentiment within the Eurogroup currently with regards perhaps wanting to introduce subsidies and um, fiscal loosening, uh, considering the current constraints and the, the need for constraints in fiscal spending um, in order to invest in perhaps sustainable energy? And just on an Irish scale, then how, do you, how might we deal with kickback from coastal communities uh, in that regard to uh, development for wind and shore? projects. Jean, yeah. it's, a, it's great to see you again. I knew I recognised you when I came in and uh, thank you for a great afternoon in UCC. I've so, enjoyed it so much uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and another, another great question. So there's a lot of caution and care 
from finance ministers in relation to the subsidy issue. Reason being a concern regarding the impact that it will have on the single market. So it is happening, but it is not happening with the scale that's happening across the world because the concern is that it will really only then benefit the countries that can afford the fiscal loosening and the subsidies in the first place. Uh, in relation to what that will mean from an energy perspective, uh, I mean, my, my sense is, is the... My sense is the investments that are happening in that area are really more about investments than they are about subsidies. Investments in how we support the private sector in the delivery of infrastructure, investments regarding how the state at times pays for the infrastructure itself. But like the really, um, you know, we go back to the origins of our union and our union many decades ago had its origin in an energy union. And... Uh, uh, I think a very exciting phase of our national economic development and then what will happen within Europe is how we can continue with our efforts then with regard to renewable energy. And I think the state role there will maybe be less about subsidy and more about investment. Here in Ireland, regarding how we make the case for the coastal communities for us, of course, that's why the planning process in relation to all of this is so important. Important that it's... Uh, understood and seen to be independent. Important then that coastal communities have an opportunity to make their views known. Uh, but ultimately, the development of renewable energy here in Ireland for the 2020s and for 2030s, I think is as big an opportunity for our country as FDI was in the 1990s. That's how big a deal I think it is. That's what I think it can do for Ireland. So we do have to deliver that renewable energy grid that we're going to need and the infrastructure for it. And in terms of European cooperation in that space, we have, uh, I think, quite a lot of like-minded countries Huge developing number. offshore wind. If you look at the collaboration that's happening between yeah. ourselves and France now in all of mm. that area, huge opportunities, yeah. Mm. Um, just maybe if I can get an idea of how many people want to ask more questions, just because the time is marching on. So um, I saw two hands. Okay, if there's any more, maybe make yourself known to me. I'll go to this gentleman here first. And we have Brian as well. So we go to this gentleman, then we go to Prince, I think it is here. Yeah. Hey, um, Philip Corpus. I work in statistics also in the central bank. Um, I was just wondering, um, just as you were talking about the future of EU and the next generation, uh, do you have any insights on the current state of Irish financial education and your thoughts on in further improving accessibility and efforts into financial literacy? Um, so yeah, if you have any thoughts on that. Great question. Yep, thank you very much. Hello, Mr. Minister. My name Hi. is Pran Singh. I'm working for Intel. And my question is like, very soon you're going for the election. And before that or after that, are you looking for a potential collaborator for the Irish economy, especially in the terms of those like African and Asian country, apart from China? Am I looking for what, pardon me? A collaboration for the oh, Irish economy. Collaboration. Sorry, gotcha. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So I think we're doing, I, I, I'm really impressed by the work that's happening in financial literacy in our schools. I have uh, two uh, young adults who are in our secondary schools at the moment. Uh, at second level, and I um, uh, I look at the, the subjects they're studying and the work they now have to do and how they think about financial literacy. And I think actually we're doing a, I think we're doing a pretty good job of it at the moment, actually. I'm really encouraged by it uh, as I see my kids now grapple with concepts like how does insurance work? Oh, I think it's great. And I think it's really interesting how our schools are now teaching slightly more abstract topics through the reality of daily commercial and economic life. So I'm actually um, uh, really impressed by the work that's happening there at the moment. Opportunities for collaboration, absolutely. We have to continue to find ways in which we can collaborate uh, uh, with so many other parts of the world in relation to how we can deliver inclusive economic growth. Uh, because of where we are in the world, because of our closeness to Europe, it's inevitable that we look to Europe and America 
regarding how we work together. Uh, but absolutely, it's something the government always wants to explore, definitely. Okay, very good. Um, I might take one from the Zoom here. Um, and I think uh, Seamus might be challenging you to give a, a robust uh, defense of the, of the euro here, but he says, um, is the minister able to comment on the advantages and disadvantages that Ireland has experienced being in the eurozone two decades on? Uh, how different would Ireland's economic experience have been in relation to Brexit and COVID had it stayed out of the euro? If we stayed out had of we the euro. Out, yeah. oh, well, I mean, if, if, if we had stayed out of the euro, we would have enjoyed our, our punt still being pegged to sterling. Like, hmm. what an experience of sovereignty that would be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like our currency before joining the euro was pegged to sterling. What happened in sterling had very significant effects on what happened within the Irish economy. And that was, if you, for those of you who read um, Irish economic history, for those of you who read studies of what happened in the Department of Finance, when sterling moved, it had an immediate effect on what happened to our currency. Uh, and the, the idea that that is, could have offered a better um, counterfactual history or future mm -hmm. than the reality of sharing and pooling our economic sovereignty through our membership of the ECB and through political entities like the euro area. I think we can make a really compelling case regarding the value of the euro and that form of pooling sovereignty. Uh, uh, I think uh, an alternative world in which we are, um, if we were not in the euro, we'd be pegged to the euro now. Um, would beg the question, what's the value of being pegged to the euro but not being in it? Mm. So our history was one of being pegged to sterling. In an alternative world, it'd be one of being pegged to the euro if we still had the punt. I think either scenario demonstrates the value of where we are now. And just one thing one thing I was thinking about before the um, the event today, and I think it sort of comes back to the, the question that we had over here. Um, and since it's, it's an audience of young people as well, um, I, I think in the European Union, and obviously you spoke about next generation EU as well, there's a lot of thinking that goes on around, you know, reducing um, barriers or increasing coordination between member states. And, you know, we talk about we allocate this amount of money um, to Italy and Spain, obviously, given their, their economic conditions during COVID um, within the next generation EU recovery fund. Um, and we allocate money to countries in these proportions for this for this reason. But one thing, one thing I think about is, you know, could there be a, a greater role for the European Union in terms of addressing um, inequalities, let's say, within member states? And, you know, um, obviously young people within member states are, are less likely to accumulate wealth, as, as, you know, some of the points you've touched on earlier on. Um, or is that more of a member state level competency that is addressed through fiscal policy on the on the member state level, but it's just something that that I've been thinking about the, the last while. You know, I think it's already something that's recognised by the European Union, and that's why projects, many of the projects that are coming out of next generation EU, are aiming to do that. Mm. Uh, and uh, there is far less so here in Ireland because we are not the beneficiaries of next generation EU, to the degree to which other members of the European Union are. Uh, but so many of the other projects that are funded by Next Gen EU in other parts of the EU are aimed at young people, are aimed at how we can increase participation of young people, of women within our economy. Uh, uh, so I definitely think the EU has a role to play there. Absolutely. And it's part of how we can demonstrate a more kind of contemporary and modern role for the EU and demonstrate its very modern rationale. Very good. Um I'll go to Brian. I think you had a question at the back. Thanks, Minister, and thanks for sharing your insights today. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of the competitiveness angle you spoke about earlier. I mean, obviously, when we had the Trump administration the last time around, well, hopefully the only time around, uh, it was quite clear that Europe was united, that there was the push of Brexit, that while there was disagreements, there was a need to move on in terms of trade policy, making sure that Europe was competitive. I just wonder this time around, given the way the, the polls are looking for the European elections, 
if there's a bit of a fear that more politicals and extremes in Europe will lead to uh, difficulty having a cohesive strategy if we do end up with that administration or other challenges in the future. Thank you. I think undoubtedly it is a a, a challenge and risk. Uh, though when we were uh, look, aiming to build up that kind of cohesiveness in 20, uh, um, 2016 onwards, uh, of course, there was still see elections happening at that point within the European Union. There was at that point still different movements making the case for a different approach to Europe. Uh, but I, I would be very confident uh, that in an atmosphere of Europe having to confront big changes in leadership elsewhere in the world, that we would be able to create and maintain the cohesiveness and unity that would be needed to look after ourselves. Because, of course, the big difference between the time that you've referred to then and where we are now is the reality of a war in Europe taking place. And that of itself generates the imperative and need for unity and for working together. And uh, that's not easy. You're all aware of the challenges that we have. But ultimately, I believe we'd be successful in finding that unity again. And do you think the prospect of a of a Trump administration is something you see finance ministers thinking increasingly about around the table? Of course, we always have to respect the decision that any people make in any election. But of course, it's a factor that's being considered. And I suppose in relation to the considerations around developing European strategic autonomy, um, I mean, you know, there, there is this conundrum, I think, in many senses that, you know, or subsidies or or you know more state intervention in terms of um you know say in the united states with the inflation reduction act the european response to that was the the net zero industry act um you know you see the the global gateway in response to to china the china's um belt and road initiative um a lot of these initiatives are are responses to um conditions that are taking place elsewhere um whereas if we think about maybe the global commons as such that you know perhaps these initiatives wouldn't have been started on their own accord um so in terms of that piece around multilateralism i think i think that's where we get to the heart of why multilateralism is so important in this and how do you think we can protect that um in the time ahead regardless of who is the who is the president there is a lot the in States. that question there. <laughs> there really really is now i'd see it slightly differently i don't see the corresponding and reciprocal act to era in America mm. being our net zero act. The parallel act to that was next generation EU. Mm. So I, I, and if you look at next generation EU and the size and scale of that, that was an extraordinary economic intervention. The rationale for which was not what was happening in America. The rationale was how we looked after ourselves and each other. And, you know, you refer there to the global commons and the future of multilateralism. And I think it is, I think, only honest to acknowledge the challenge that those commons are facing at the moment. As we see other parts of the world rising and we see the potential for fracture and obvious friction that we have at the moment. Uh, so for me, the greatest contribution that we can make to that multilateralism is uh, obviously continuing to stand by institutions like the UN and the WTO and try to play our role and then working better in the future. But my God, it's investing in the European Union and looking after us and doing our best to get the kind of unity and coherence that your friend asked me about a moment ago. So that when Europe does speak and when we look to act, we're doing so in a way that approaches partners and friends from a position of better strength. And we can do that. Um, I'm reading at the moment a great book that I'd recommend to all of you. I think everybody in this audience would love it. Circle of Stars. And it's a history of the EU. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's written by a very, very learned academic. It's not quite academic, but it's also far more substantial than it to be a work of journalism. It's a really accessible, great piece of modern economic and political history. 
And it just reminds you again and again of the value of the EU when it could speak with roughly kind of one voice. So with all its voices roughly pointing in the same direction. And that's what we have to aspire to the maintenance and growth of. Um, okay, well, I, I think we've we've come up to the end. Uh, but before you uh, go, I wanted to do a, a quick fire round. That's um, always the most dangerous <laughs> part. It's like if you're at a political meeting and you get to AOB, that's the very dangerous part of it. So I'm going to have a glass of yeah, water. Well, <laughs> well, you, you might have uh, preempted uh, one of my questions, uh, which will be the last one. But as I say, the questions that people uh, really want to know. Um, if you were stuck on a desert island and you could bring one cabinet minister with you, who would have been another? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, God, I'm not answering that question. <laughs> I, I, Down there lies ridicule or great danger. I, I, I had a feeling you might. So, do I get to pass one? Uh, you can pass one, but maybe okay. not the other two. You might want to pass the other two now. We, we'll see. We'll oh, see my how you get on. God. We'll, oh, we'll see how you get on with the other two. Yeah, um, I mean, how can I answer that? <laughs> I mean, if I say Leo, the T should could go on. No, that you know, you're only saying that because he's your boss. <laughs> uh, if I say Michael McGrath, he'll say, "Really, you guys get on that that well?" Which we do. But you see, yeah, no, I think I'm going to have to ask for a pass on that now. It, it seems like you and Michael McGrath will get along well. I'm sort of nudging you towards the answer here now, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. So okay, um, <laughs> great. okay, thank you. Um, that is a great question. Um, <laughs> one, one, one which I'm not going to answer. Though. <laughs> <laughs> um, your favorite political leader, uh, past or present, uh, and why? Mm, Ireland, European, anyone you like. Oh, God. So I, I will answer that question. That's a better one. That's an e. That's a less risky one than the Death <laughs> Island one, but no easier to. So I would have to say that at a European level. I mean, it, 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 it it's hard not to continue to be awed by the political vision of the early group of leaders for the European Union, and particularly figures like Monet. It's really hard not to be impressed by their determination to gradually transform Europe in, in such difficult circumstances. So I'd I'd have to identify like Monet and that group and all around them for what mm. they managed to do. If I was to move um, a kind of uh, a little bit more recently here in Ireland, I'd have to say Gareth Fitzgerald. Mm. He's always somebody that inspires me, and for reasons that I hope that I will be obvious to you at the moment, I've had lots of reasons to lament. Uh, the passing of John Bruton, mm. uh, who was a man well known to this building and his his decency and warmth uh, are qualities that um, are perhaps a little less obvious to the public than his intellect. Mm. And uh, he was a he was a really good leader. Uh, so they're they're the kind of just some of the early responses I'd have to that. Mm. Uh, and uh, most fascinating lead leader, Linda Bain Johnson, the one we really needed was FDR, mm. from an and, American point of view. And, and for those of you who don't know, John was a long-standing member of, yeah. the, of the IIA board, um, very active participant in our, in our UK and, and future of Europe groups. Um, and he we, loved things like this. Yeah. He loved audiences like all of you. Mm. He was he was great, mm. and he'll be sorely missed yeah. by all of us. And um, final one, um, your favorite book you've read in the last year? Actually, that's a very easy one because I've just finished an amazing book, amazing called "In the Long Run" by Jonathan White, and he is a. Uh, it's about the relationship between politics, democracy, and time, and it was the book I was planning to write. And he's gone and written it, and he's done a far better job than I ever could have. 
it's basically about saying that democracy and politics is so dependent on how you talk about the future. But if people think the future is running out, what does that mean for democracy? And it's wonderful. And I just finished this and I, I'm galled that he got to write it before I did. Mm -hmm. But he, thank God he wrote us because he could get a far better job than I ever could. Mm -hmm. So it's a wonderful book. So I, 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 I really, really have to recommend that. And then <clears throat> I'm going to, cheese because I didn't answer your first question. So can I get a second answer? <laughs> you, that you, you can get, yeah, yeah. The most enjoyable novel I've read in a little, in a, in a kind of a, a little while that is uh, really relevant to some of the stuff we've talked about here tonight is In My Father's House by Joseph O'Connor, which is the story of Monsignor Hugh Flaherty, who grew up in Cahar Sivine, ended up as a priest in the Vatican and tried to save and did save um, uh, allied prisoners in World War II. And it's so relevant to what we're talking about here uh, because it's a reminder of what happens uh, when all else fails. And it's a really good book, really beautiful. Mm. So, on a, on a similar theme, I think one of my favourites in The Twilight of Democracy by uh, Anne Applebaum. Anne Applebaum. And, um, you know, Anne Applebaum, always quote her, you asked me earlier on about is the glass half full or glass empty. Uh, Anne Applebaum once told me that pessimism is irresponsible. Hmm. What a lovely note to end it on. Um, Great. So Thanks a million. Thank you for being here. This is an amazing institute. You do great work uh, for all of you by being members of this network and for your companies. Uh, and uh, supporting the work of the IIEA. Thank you for doing this. And thank you, Dara, for uh, uh, I've really enjoyed the evening. It's lovely being here. Thank you so much.